That's Krishna. 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 No. Keep pretty tight. <laughs> I'm going to have four of us, not two. Yeah, it's not that good. Bye. 
Hare Krishna. How are you? Good. You stay here? No, I'm staying in Chesno. Chesno. I come here. Oh, wonderful. What's your name? Mahesh Bhakta Mahesh. That's right, Mahesh Prabhu. Yes, it's nice to see you again. Thanks. Hare Krishna. Good. Where's Wayne? Is Wayne here? There he is. Hare Ball. How are you feeling? Oh, yes. Feeling better? Wicked. Wicked, eh? <laughs> My goodness, he's honest at least. <laughs> I was hoping to get some jobs done go home here on daily, but I'm coming back to Wicked man. Wicked man. Yeah, wicked man. Who else is here? Who else is arrived? Okay. Hare Krishna. And who's re are we reading Bhagavatam today? Yeah, we are from the 22nd chapter, Pitu Maharaj is meeting with the Kumara. Ah, the verse number? 36. 36? <coughs> yes. <coughs> okay. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Matages here. <laughs> Dear me. This is a monastery. Enatsyatsomi. Yeah. <clears throat> Vanaprasta. Yeah. Is, uh, is Shrango okay? Is he walking around? Is he looking for something? He doesn't know where anything is. He may want some water. He doesn't know where to get the drink or the toilet. He doesn't know anything. He went left, that way. So, text number 36. Pare, Pare, Avare, Avare, Ja, Ye, Vavaha, Una, Gatika, Gatikarat, Anu, Na, Tesha, Vidyate, Shemam, Isha, Vidvam Sita, Ashisham, Parevare Chaye Bhava, Una Vyatikarad Anu, Nantesham Vidyate Kshemam, Shavidvam Shita Shisham Shavidvam Shita Shisham Pareva Chaye Bhava Pareva Shavidvam Shita Shisham Una 
Nateshan vidyatek shemam Nateshan vidyatek shemam Isha vidvam shita shisham Isha vidvam shita shisham Rebare chaye baba Rebare chaye baba Gunavyatikara danu Gunavyatikara danu Nateshan vidyatek shemam Nateshan vidyatek shemam क्षेम Okay, we we have to take us there later on. We'll preach them. <laughs> hey. is it? Staying here, not coming to Bhagavatam class. Hey, Krishna, they're already living the Bhagavatam. The whole world is the Bhagavatam for a self-realized soul, and the cows are certainly living the Srimad Bhagavatam, especially here, because they are serving Krishna. Lucky cows, huh? one of a million, one amongst a million cows. So today's verse is from the chapter Prithu Maharaj's meeting with the Kumaras. Word for word, Pare. In the higher status of life. In the higher status of life. Of a ray. In the lower status of life. Cha and yea. All those. Bhavaha. Conceptions. Guna. Material qualities. Yati Karat. By interaction. Anu. Following. Na. Never. Never. Tesha. Of them. Of them. Vitite. Vitite. Exist. Exist. Shema. Shema. Correction. Correction. Isha. Isha. The Supreme Lord. Supreme Lord. Vidvamshita. Vidvamshita. Destroyed. Destroyed. Ashish, Ashisham. Ashisham. Of the blessings. Of the blessings. I'll say one thing. If Vishaka were here, she would get them all to come to class. Yeah. Vishaka. Remember Abu Shaka? Yeah, in Malaysia. In Malaysia, yeah. yeah. Was in Malaysia. Did you see her? No, I read that. She would get those cows to come to class. Even if they didn't want to, she'd have them at least sitting out there listening. She'd be in here listening. They'd have to, they might sit outside. You all know that, that cow we had in Malaysia. One of our cows in Malaysia used to come and sit in the class every day with the ladies in class. Maybe. But can't understand the language. <laughs> she may she could understand their language but she wasn't able to speak it. She could understand. 
It was clearly obvious she could understand Tamil at least. Because when you say something, she could respond to it. Not English, she didn't understand English. Amazing cow. She used to stand up during Kirtan, sit down during Prashadam, sit down during class. <laughs> Don't get many cows like that. Do you? We accept as blessings different states of higher life, distinguishing them from lower status of life, lower states of life. But we should know that such <coughs> distinctions exist only in relation to the interchange of the modes of material nature. Actually, these states of life have no permanent existence. Thank God for that. <coughs> Isn't it a relief to know that? These states of life have no permanent existence. For all of them will be destroyed by the Supreme Controller. Who is speaking? Sanatkumara. Sanatkumara. Purple. So they've already been uh, received by Preacher Maharaj. In our material existence, we accept a higher form of life as a blessing and a lower form of as a curse. This distinction of higher and lower exists only as long as the different material qualities, gunas, interact. In other words, by our good activities we are elevated to the higher planetary system or to a higher standard of life. Good education, beautiful body, wealth, etc. These are the results of pious activities. Similarly, by impious activities, we remain illiterate. We get ugly bodies, a poor standard of living, etc. But all these different states of life are under the laws of material nature through the interaction of the qualities of goodness, passion and ignorance. But, However, all these qualities will cease to act at the time of the dissolution of the entire cosmic manifestation. What do they mean? When the material energies in their present manifested form return into their unmanifested form into pradhana and then of course at the end of the dis final dissolution uh, enter back into the whole everything including the jivas enter back into the body of Mahavishnu at the end of total dissolution of the universe. What does it all mean? Just like a dream. Just like a dream, we're dreaming that I'm well educated, that I'm rich, that I'm handsome, that I'm this and I'm that. Just a dream. In the Bhagavad Gita, the Lord therefore says, Abhmabhuvanaloka punaravatin arjuna mamupecha tu kontea punajanmana vidyate. Even though we elevate ourselves to the highest planetary systems by the scientific advancement of knowledge or by the religious principles of life, great sacrifices and fruitive activities at the time of dissolution, these higher planetary systems and life on them will be destroyed. Even though we're elevated to go to Nugokula, we have to return to Sydney. <laughs> <laughs> Who's put that in the purport? You've rewritten the purport? <laughs> yes, you have to go back to Sydney, I'm sorry. You can't stay here. You have to be very fortunate to stay here. Even if you are very fortunate, you can't stay here forever in one sense. You've got this glorious, but we're not here in that sense too stay in Sydney or Cessnock or Maitland or Newcastle, even Woi Woi or Gosford, anywhere. It's not our business. We're here to realize where we can really stay. 
we will not be protected no matter where we go in this material world. Our bodies either in this planet or in another planet will be destroyed. And again we will have to remain for millions of years in an unconscious state within the body of Mahavishnu. And again, when the creation is manifested, we have to take birth in different species of life and begin our activities again. Therefore, we should not be satisfied simply by a promotion to the higher planetary systems. We should try to get out. The purpose of our being here at New Kokul, of course, this is the spiritual world. We have to go cool and under here. But at the same time, our minds may still be in the material world. Our consciousness is still attracted to the material world. So the point of our being here is to get out of this material consciousness. It's one thing, annihilation of the universe, or temporal, partial annihilation at the end of the day of Lord Brahma, uh, when everything retracts into Garbhadakshai Vishnu. But the final, the real pralaya, the real let's say, um, bring into an end the devastation. It's not even that, because you have to come back again. It's just like the sun sets at night. Is that the end of, of creation? Is that the end of your life? Is it the end of the sun? It's all over? No. You go to sleep at night. Twelve hours, whatever you sleep, I don't know. <laughs> How many hours do you sleep? Eight or nine. Eight or nine, not bad, eh? <laughs> Eight or nine. Some of us are very expert at sleeping long, long hours. <laughs> but even if you sleep, the morning comes again. It starts again, right? And you have to start off where you we left off the night before, more or less, isn't it? You might take a little while waking up, shaking up. Well, who am I? Where am I? What's going on? Oh, no. But basically you carry on where you left off the night before. You know, maybe different things at different times of the day, but basically you just carry on. You don't wake up a new person the next day, do you? You know, have a swap with your next door neighbour. Let's <laughs> swap tomorrow, shall we? You can be me and I can be you. After when we wake up in the... No, you, you wake up... Well, sometimes a person has some problems, some imbalance of his psychophysical condition and can't remember who they are and it seems to be like they're a different guy. But generally speaking, you wake up sort of more or less the same person the next day, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So like that, when the devastation comes, partial devastation, the living entities go in and during the night of Lord Brahma and have a nice sleep. Um, if you like sleeping, you just hang around at the end of Lord Brahma's day. You can sleep for a, 4,300 million years. Uh, is that long enough? <laughs> and if you're really into, you know, really, really, really you know, wait to the end of the wait to the end of the universe when Brahma leaves his, you know, quits his body, you can remain for. You can't say how long. Probably just uses the term millions of years, but it's countless how long you can stay in an unconscious state in the form of Mahavishnu, before again he breathes out. And uh, according to, geez, you must have a pretty good accountant, but according to the previous uh, karmas, your previous you know, existence, you get born again somewhere in some universe, in some material body, and so it goes on ad infinitum, until we actually you know, shake and wake and get out of this, and make a break. This is a, the whole purpose of human life is to break out of this you know, cycle of samsara. And the real devastation is not just the external one, nothing going on, there's nothing we can do about it. There's partial, there's, there's like localized devastations, there's, you know, planetary devastations, there's universal devastation, there's all kinds of devastations, physical devastation of our body, you know, lo very localized, that one. And there's all kinds of devastations and the internal devastations are there for individuals and <coughs> local platforms. So. But the real devastation, the real polaya is when we actually, because unless we come to this one where we actually change our consciousness, 
You have to just go through one type of devastation after another. You can't have hama bhuvana loka bhuvana bhuvana It's suffering. You can't stop it. You've got to experience one devastation after another. Or one... Wicked. Say wicked. Wicked, yeah, come <laughs> What is that, wicked? <coughs> not well, I suppose. Always not. You have to experience one flu, flu? One flu after the next, one something or another. They never end. There's no end to the varieties of suffering that you can experience <coughs> in this material creation. The real devastation when we change our conscience, when we give up the causes of our being in this material, when we remove the cause, not the effect. People just want to deal with the effect all the time. They're trying to adjust things so that we, you know, we feel better in this world. You know, we can die feeling better. You know, we can go down feeling proud of our achievements as we drown in the ocean. <coughs> you can't stop the wheel of time. No one can stop this wheel of Kala Chakra. It just goes on beyond their capacity. But it is, at least, the opportunity is there within this human form of life to get out of it. Most people, even religions, generally speaking, are trying to make it more comfortable to try to go to the higher planets or at most to get liberation. But rarely do they really have a, a picture of how to get out of this cycle. We will not be protected. We are, you know. And again when the creation is meant. Therefore we should not be satisfied simply to be promoted. We should try to get out. Go to the spiritual world and take shelter of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And take shelter of this material body or the material effects around us, whatever they may be. That is our highest achievement. We should not be attracted by anything material, higher or lower, but should consider them all on the same level. They're all of the same source of transformation of electricity into different forms, has different temporary effects, but basically it's the same energy. Everything is the external energy of the Lord. And so when we become attached to one or the other, then we become entangled in the, four, the three modes of material nature, karma, grunt and abundanum. We become entangled in karma, or in action and reaction, because we're attached to a certain situation and we act according to that attachment and become implicated in this material world. And we identify everything. But it's just a various show, a various, you can say, Maya, a drama. Maya is the director, directing these three modes of nature. We're really just watching it, but because of identification with it, we're being infected by it. But it's not really of any ultimate significance. In fact, even though Takura describes, there is nothing of any substance or significance in this universe as such other than the jiva and the holy name because the jiva is the permanent feature and the holy name is the means of, of awakening the jiva to his actual nature of releasing or freeing us from this material world our real engagement should be inquiring about the real purpose of life and rendering devotional service to the Lord. Yeah, early on, uh, Siddha Goswami had said early on, Kama Sanindriya Abhikilabhu Jivati Abhikilabhu Jiva Siddhattva Jignasna Tiyasche Karma Bhira. This life is not meant for sense gratification, it's meant for inquiry, Jiva Siddhattva Jignasna, into the nature of the absolute truth. That should be the goal of our, all of our work. Thus we will be eternally blessed in our spiritual activities, full of knowledge and bliss. We make that. Simply, same thing in one sense, doing things, maybe. But the purpose is different. The purpose is to find out. Instead of finding out how we can improve the situation in this world, our engagement should be how we can get out of this world by inquiring about the Supreme Lord, Omatapa Brahmadignas, the purpose of human life, to inquire about the nature of the Absolute Truth. Regulated human civilization promotes Dharma, Artha, Kama and Moksha. In human society there must be religion. Without religion, human society is only... 
animal society. Economic development and sense gratification must be based on pardon? Dharma. Dharma. religious principles. When religion, economic development and sense gratification are adjusted, liberation from this material birth, death, old age and disease is assured. When they're properly adjusted, that is. And one follows actual Dharma to Shaksha Bhagavat when they come, the religion given by the Lord, they may lead to liberation. In the present age of Kali, however, there is no question of religion and liberation. People have taken interest only in economic development um, all over the world, dealings in human society, and sense gratification. Therefore, despite sufficient economic development all over the world, dealings in human society have become almost animalistic. Earlier on, generally, religion is a means to try to fulfill our material objectives, in most cases. And liberation in people is almost unknown from the material world. Therefore, despite sufficient economic development all over the world, um, dealings in human society become almost animalistic. When everything becomes grossly animalistic, dissolution takes place. This dissolution is to be accepted as Isha Vidvang Shita Shisham. The Lord's so called blessings of economic development and sense gratification will be conclusively dissolved by destruction. And again, different types of destruction, isn't it? Like in this age of Kali, that everything is completely destroyed at the end of this age. No, it's not. But there's a, a tremendous amount of destruction or annihilation on the behalf of, or by Kalki, Lord Kalki. But the world remains, and certain some people remain, and the general, let's say, facilities of the world remain, uh, to start, but there's a tremendous destruction in the case. At the end of this Kali Yuga, the Lord will appear as Kalki, and his only business will be to kill human beings on the surface of the globe. After that killing, another golden age will begin. We should therefore know that our material activities are just like childish play. Children may play on the beach and the father will sit and watch this childish play, the construction of buildings with sand, the constructions of walls and so many things. But finally the father will ask the children to come home. Then everything is destroyed. Persons who are too much addicted and the childish activities of economic development and sense gratification are sometimes especially favored by the Lord when he destroys their construction of these things. They think that that's, you know, the curse of the Lord. Just like in Christchurch, I don't know if any of you were around at that time in Christchurch, many of you were not in Christchurch then. You're not in Perth anymore? You're still in Perth. So, um, I was there a few weeks after the earthquake a few years ago and we attended the memorial ceremony where it was called on the common, on Hagley Common and there were hundreds of thousands of people there the Prime Minister was there and I think the guy from Australia came over and Prince somebody, uh, William or somebody was there all the you know, big, the big shots were there I mean, you know, the, the uh, you know, what do you call it? Archbishop or whatever they call it, the Cathedral Church the head of the Christ Catholic Church, the head of the Protestant, they're all there, you know, giving their speeches on the stage to the assembled crowd. We were obligated to go, you know, as part of the community. And uh, we didn't have a chance to speak, it was all these big knobs all over the place. And then some big Maori you know, talking, what on earth he was talking. Even the newspaper said it was the worst, worst speech they'd ever heard him give. He <laughs> said that in the newspaper talking about the trees and the river local cuckoo or something like that. <laughs> and, uh, and then the, the, the head of the Christian church said, this is not the work of God. What is going on? This, this glorious city of Christ church, we will rebuild the city again in the glory of God. 
this is the work of the... He was going, basically saying the devil's work. You know. <laughs> no idea. No idea. And the American... We will rebuild Christ's kingdom better than it ever was before! Wars, you know. <laughs> more bottle shops. Huh? More, more liquor shops. More and more what? Liquor shops. Liquor shops, yeah, more and more liquor shops. The first thing they put the money into was the rugby stadium. They didn't care about you know, 20,000 people's houses being destroyed. They put them a, a billion, a couple of billion into the rugby stadium to try to get that back in action again. You would have brains around. Anyway, understand, this is a sign from God. I was going to Sagatana maybe a week or two after that. Earthquake, maybe three weeks after it, in Sangatan, the town, just outside of Christchurch, just doing books. I went in this shop, and I asked this lady, how, what, how did, you know, because that wasn't quite so affected by the earthquake. And I said, asked her how she felt, and what do you think about this, the earthquake, how is it affecting She said, they, they deserved it, she said. They deserved it! Mm -hmm. Well, you said, all the damn things that are going on around here, they deserved it, she said. <laughs> she a little pious lady. Yeah, it's not just we deserve things. Krishna's trying to teach us a lesson. You know, it's a bit cruel to say you deserve it, especially on the spot. They can't handle that, you know. But a lesson. Come on, try to learn a lesson. Krishna's telling you you don't belong here. You're too comfortable, boy. Sitting in that chair at the back of the temple room there. Too comfortable. <laughs> You're too comfortable back there. This is a, a lesson. Sometimes he knocks the chair out from underneath us and then, Oh, God, what's going on around me? <laughs> Who did that? Hey! <laughs> <laughs> Why is God doing this to us? He's teaching us a lesson, that's all. You can't depend on this material. There's no shelter. There's no protection. You understand? Sure? Are they teaching you that at school? <laughs> no. What are they teaching you at school? How to get shelter from the material world. Yes. How to enjoy the material world. How to make money. <laughs> enjoy the material world, right? Get a degree. Right? Get a degree and enjoy. Right? Come to Sydney. What are you doing out here in, in Millfield? What are you doing out here? You should be working in Sydney. I've never had a job in my life, Mark. That's terrible. <laughs> Lazy fella. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't you see all the intelligent people who were there? They're all driving into Sydney to yeah. intelligent, the few intelligent people who live out here. Lazy people out here sitting on the, sitting down here. Doing nothing. Do something useful. Work hard. Work hard. Get a job. Make money. Get a big car so you can get to work. And a big <laughs> house. And pay a big mortgage and work harder to pay your mortgage. <laughs> and then when they sack you, you have your house taken away from you because you can't pay the mortgage. Right? What happens? Enjoy! Eat nice processed food. <laughs> Take some nice drugs. Drink some nice liquor. Smoke some nice cigarettes. Pay some nice speeding fines. <laughs> what other wonderful things can you do in this world? Hmm? Anything else? You can play footy. Is that what they call it? They call it footy? Rugby. Rugby. You can surf. You can surf. You can enjoy your surf. Have you been surfing? He hasn't worked. He hasn't surfed. What has he done? He's wasted 50% of his life. <laughs> Gambling at the right.
races. Huh? Gambling at the races. Races? Gambling. Gambling at the races. Gambling. 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 No, you can gamble. Yeah, you can gamble your, your debts. <laughs> That's what people do. They borrow money to gamble. Isn't it? And then they get further in debt. And you can, many wonderful things you can do. That's just a few. I mean, it's just, it's, just imagine what you're missing. There's so many things. Especially in Australia. The heavenly planet. <laughs> Probably because I mean, I, perhaps you've been to the beach. Nice beaches, right? So many nice beaches, isn't it, Kalia? Mm. Oh, we have a pool down the bank, right? You have a pool? Yeah. What, for the gambling pool or what is that? We have a nice uh, dam, swimming. You have a dam? Yeah. So we'll go swimming later on. You want to go swimming? You can try. Huh? You can try. <laughs> <laughs> So many wonderful things. And it probably says you're like a child on the beach. Isn't it? Remember, go back a few years, maybe you did, I don't know. We used to go to the used to do that shrangle at the beach in Blackpool. Make sand castles. Used to go to Blackpool, right? Mm, yes. Must have done. You lived a couple of miles away from Blackpool. Blackpool Beach. Nothing compares with Blackpool Beach. <laughs> <laughs> nothing, nothing. Only Western Supermere compares with Blackpool. <laughs> you couldn't find a more horrible beach if you tried. <laughs> <laughs> Millions of people go there and sit next to each other. They work in the factory, well, they don't do that now. Work in the office. Live next door and then they go to the, the beach and they all sit there in deck chairs and with an umbrella to stop the rain. <laughs> I'm wondering when the tide will come in. And it's like 50 miles out there, so when it comes in once a day, then it goes out faster than you can catch it when it goes out. That's true. Horrible. Anyway, people go there, you make sand when they're young, we make these sand castles. You had that experience? Making sand castles on the beach? When you're a kid and you're trying to protect it, you know, the tides and make a castle there, you know, put a moat around it and a wall, and, you know, and you're hoping they're going to put, and you're in there, you're trying to protect against the tide comes in and you're like, oh, <laughs> it's just, whoosh, all goes. And you're crying and crying and crying and, you know, you lost your castle. That's all the Prabhupada said, that's what's going on here in this world, we're just making sand castles, that's all. Tall ones. Sydney is full of tall sand castles. It is a sand castle, that's what it's made of, isn't it? It's just made of sand in a different compressed way. The architect, you know all these things. Glass is also based on sand. Cement is based on sand. It's just a sand castle, just combined in a different way. And the tide would come along soon and just sweep it all away, isn't it? It could happen just like that. Boom. Could be an earthquake. Boom. What would you do? Boom. Crumble to the ground. Crumble to the ground. Just like in Christchurch, they thought they were protected, right? They have the most, uh, uh, practically speaking, anti-earthquake built buildings in Christchurch that you can get. They're, they're built for quite extreme earthquakes. Quite extreme. But this one, they weren't ready for it. Earthquakes normally go, they go, oh, 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 like this, and the epicenter, boom, 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 boom. This one went, boom, 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 boom. Mm. It went up. It's the first time such a powerful earthquake in, in history, as their records, isn't it? Went up, like that. It wasn't very powerful, but because it went up, boom. the buildings weren't built to withstand two and a half times the speed of gravity force going up. It was two and a half times the speed of gravity, the up force. They weren't protected. They were only built for about 50% up or something. They don't get that. So you don't know. You think, oh, we're protected, we're safe. But don't worry. There's Krishna or Krishna's energies, his representatives, they find a way around it. You can't. <laughs>
who cares? Okay, we mentioned that yesterday, didn't we, about the, the man who thought he could evade death. <coughs> he was, what was he, an expert what? Sculpture. Sculptor, very good. And what did he do? He sculpted many um, similar forms of himself. Exactly. Isn't he attentive? Fantastic. I don't know if anybody, anyone else would have got that. Well, I don't case you know. He, he was an expert sculptor, so he made dozens of identical forms to himself. And because he was just about to die, he knew death was coming. So he thought, no, I might avoid, avoid getting captured by the Yamadutas. They might grab the wrong one. <laughs> because they all looked identical. <coughs> and when the Yamadutas come, they have a picture of you. See? <laughs> Someone else gives him a picture. This is the guy. Wanted. Huh? Wanted. Yeah, wanted. <laughs> Dead. <laughs> Dead. <laughs> the repossession, you know? Hey, repossession. Repossession. <laughs> they come to repossess. <laughs> and uh, so they had a picture and they came there and they were there. Hey, what's going on here? He will look the same. What are we going to do? Which one is it? <laughs> Which one are we supposed to take? They only, had, they only had license to take one. They couldn't take them all. So said, Which one is it? Well, one of them was very clever. He said, mm. Mm. Well, whoever made these sculptors, these models, or whatever they are, was a lousy sculptor. <laughs> Terrible. And immediately, of course, the actual person said, What do you mean I'm a lousy sculptor? <laughs> ah! <laughs> Where he went. <laughs> Got him. And you can't trip death. You can't trick it. You can't get away from it. No matter who we are. Rich, poor, educated, heavenly planets, hellish, wherever we are, even Brahma cannot avoid it. It is said, it is said <coughs> by the Lord, yes, Yahum Vinami Harishetadanam Shanai. The Lord told you this dear Maharaj that his spirit special favor is shown to his devotee when he takes away all the devotee's material opulences. Special favor. Do we take it like that? Do we take it like that? Huh? Oh no! I've been joining Hare Krishna and Krishna's taking it away! This is terrible! I've lost my... I've lost everything! Why am I? We sometimes think the opposite. Why is Krishna doing this to me? I'm chanting Hare Krishna. Prabhupada also. He, this verse, uh, Bhagavatam Prabhupada quoted this quite often because he realized that's what Krishna was doing to him. To um, clear the pathway for his mission. Sometimes Krishna gives a lot of opulence, depending on the circumstance. If it's an obstacle or some or another, it's uh, I think we say, an obstacle, Krishna will take it away. That's his mercy. And if he gives it, that's also his mercy. We should see it like that. We either get or get, we don't get. We should see that some other Krishna is giving us his mercy. He knows what's best for us. One time one devotee man in, in London, he knew to Krishna consciousness, he came to the temple. And he was, you know, sometimes they begin to get a little bit, I'd say, over, maybe a little bit over sentimental, enthusiastic mixture of enthusiasm and sentimentality, but he was, a, he was quite a well-situated man, businessman in, the, in London, in the finance market. And uh, he, he kind of got quite serious in his own way about Krishna consciousness. Maybe he didn't take advice what to do, but he, he actually started praying to the Lord of Krishna. I just wonder, you know, please, just take, just remove anything which is an obstacle to my devotional service. He started praying, that's what he said he did. Started praying, and after a short while, he didn't come anymore. Mm -hmm. We didn't see him, and it took quite a while—maybe a year, two years—I don't know—quite a while before he came back again. 
And then you know, said, ask him, what, what, what happened? Where have you been? He said, well, <laughs> yeah, just everything has just gone completely wrong. I got sacked from my job. My wife left me. I went bankrupt. I crashed my car. You know, one leak COVID case after another different. He said, my life just became every. I lost everything. And then, you know, in discussion, he realized it was when, when he actually was praying like that, Krishna took all those things away. It's a funny thing. It doesn't usually happen like that, but in his case, he did. Both he came back to Krishna consciousness again. And for whatever reason, Krishna took, took things away from him. Maybe they were obstacles on his path to spiritual life. But that's the way Krishna only deals. But if we, again, is a question of stages. Although these stages are there in the material world, and they are, you could say, I was setting this verse, ultimately illusory of no ultimate value. For one who is within the stages, we have to know what, it's like if we're sick, um, in one sense the soul's not sick, but the body is sick. And you don't just give the same medicine to everybody. People are at different types of sickness and at different stages within the sickness. One has to know the appropriate dosage the appropriate nature of the medicine at that particular stage. Similarly, even in our own devotional services, there are certain things which are more appropriate at certain stages. We don't try to imitate someone at a more advanced stage. Otherwise we may, we may trip, we may fall. Everything else is, you know, we have to know what is, what is relevant for our advancement at a particular stage. Devotional service, although it may not be. It could be said from the spiritual point of view, so to speak. Just surrender to Krishna. <coughs> Give up everything and just surrender to me, Krishna says. But you know, this, that's the goal. And the path of surrender may be just offering the fruits of one's work to Krishna, or just doing some work for Krishna. Krishna gives the stages also. But that's the ultimate goal of following the path of surrender. You can't stop it. Sometimes we start off... Thing I can completely surrender, and maybe you're already ready for it, but not everyone is. We still have a lot of attachments. <coughs> and they have to be, our heart has to be purified. We have to be purified. It's not enough just to, just to give up the material world and remain attached to the material world. So, come in, Riyani, Samyamya, your esteem and assessment, and Indigatu, Muda. Gicharas, which you take, Krishna says. But one who does that, who tries to give up the material world, but his heart remains attached, or consciousness is attached to the material world, although we've given up externally, is simply a pretender and a fool. We have to go through the right path in order to purify our consciousness. Otherwise, it's just a matter of time before we fall sometimes deeply right back into material world. So the process of purification is a stage, generally it's gradual, to gradually move towards that of complete surrender. Not some artificial um, imposition, but a natural. Because why? Because we're actually uh, getting some knowledge, understanding who we are. Who are we? We're waking up. When you wake up, naturally things become clear. Things start to become clear. Krishna is actually this, and you start to become attracted towards Krishna. And then naturally one's attraction for this material world reduces. But having to make an artificial effort to avoid one is so busy or engaged in Krishna's service that one doesn't have to worry so much about that. We just finished the prayer point. The The Lord told you this, dear Maharaj, that his special favor is shown to his devotee when he takes away all the devotee's material objects. Generally, therefore, it is experienced that Vaishnavas are not very opulent in the material sense. Take it away or give it. So the recommended path of bhakti is that we <coughs> offer everything to Krishna. Then it's, in that sense, it's not ours. If one is that little mature, we can understand that everything I'm so-called have, it belongs to Krishna. One simply uses it in Krishna's service. So in one sense, it's already taken away. And if we don't have that recognition, or that not behaving in that way, 
Then, if Krishna is very kind, then he may take it away from us to, to try to wake him up. <coughs> when a Vaishnava pure devotee tries to be materially opulent and at the same time desires to serve the Lord, his devotional service is checked. That's it. And if one's already materially opulent, that's a little different. If we try to become materially opulent, in other words, that's our, our endeavor to attain material opulence. So that will be that can be that can be can be an obstacle on one's spiritual path. The Lord, in order to show him a special favor, destroys his so-called economic development and material opulence. Many times the Buddha say, Prabhu, I'm going to do business. I'm mean, not a businessman as such, but I'm going to do some business to try to you know, make a lot of money for Krishna. It sounds good. But oftentimes, in most cases, it doesn't work. They end up not only not making money, but they often slack on their spiritual lives, working like an ass, because it's not our nature, it's not our position to imitate somebody else's natural activity. Um, and like that. There's a nice story of one um, uh, tailor, his name was Somalika, and he was a very, very good tailor, extremely good tailor. And, uh, but nobody was buying his cloth. So Somalika was saying, <laughs> Is the people in this mill field, they don't appreciate my cloth. <laughs> These people in mill field, they're not, they have no good taste. I will go somewhere else to sell my cloth. His wife said, no need. We have enough to live. Even if we're not very often, we're very poor. But we have enough to live. Not dying. He's a devotee. And he said, no, no, no. If I go to Newcastle, I will make a fortune. And I said, no need. And he, he insisted, he went off to Newcastle. He worked hard in Newcastle. Yeah, have three packets of tissue. <laughs> and he, we were collecting tissue. We, we assimilated 15 packets in, New, in Sydney. That's my special way. This is how I make my, my money. You go to various temples and collect tissue papers and then recycle them. <laughs> Even these ones, we put them in the washing machine. <laughs> um, anyway, so Maliki went off to Newcastle to make his fortune. And sure enough, after maybe six months in Newcastle, he made a fortune. And he came back to Melfield to show off his fortune. But before he reached Millfield, <coughs> he reached Elongong. What's that place called down the road? Little village? Anyway, well, let's go back one step further. He reached Cessnock. And when he got to Cessnock, he took a little rest. He was tired. So he took a little rest and he had a dream. Action! Why have you given so Malika so much wealth when he didn't deserve it? Providence, he worked so hard, I had to reward him. But now it is up to you what happens to that wealth. And he said they were ugly, horrible looking creatures who came in his dream. They were nasty for so Malika woke up and thought, my God, what was all that about? What was that all about? And he kind of had an intuition, something's gone wrong here. He looked in his trunk at all the gold coins. There was nothing left. It was all gone. Not one coin left. Oh my God. Oh, this is terrible. What am I going to do? I can't go home now. I'll be the laughing stock. I better go back again. I went back to Newcastle and worked even harder and accumulated even more wealth. Yes, he was a good tailor and the people appreciated his cloth. After even half the time, he returned to Melfield. Excuse me. And this time he said, I will not stop on the way. <laughs> I will go straight to Melfield. But as fate has its way, he didn't quite make it. 
he thought, oh, I can't, I can't walk any further. He just sat down for a few moments and, oh, he started chanting Japa. <laughs> and like all good devotees, when they start chanting Japa, they immediately fall asleep. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe he started reading the Bhagavatam. That was a perfect cure for insomnia. Stream in Bhagavatam class. <laughs> Please repeat. <laughs> Sometimes you hear the boy snoring. Sometimes you hear a bang as their head hits. <laughs> Nobody used to stand up, and he went, he went to sleep standing up, and he fell down on the devotees. <laughs> in London, one devotee was now a guru sannyasi in Eskom, fell on top of the devotee giving class. <laughs> <laughs> he was stood behind him. The Vyasa was a little bit out. He was stood behind. And I could see a little bit. He was like wobbling like this. And eventually went bang, and he landed on top of the devotee giving the class. I won't mention his name, he's now a guru in San Jose, in this one. Well, in Germany one time, I'm going to try to make this story. Yeah, they had to go through the temple to bring the plate to the altar there, in that temple, maybe in Schlossresch's office in the 70s. He said he came to the temple one day with the offering, and absolutely everyone was asleep, including the, the lecturer. <laughs> lecture was also asleep. <laughs> Everyone in the temple was asleep. <laughs> that was a really fired up Bible temple. <laughs> <laughs> it's improved. It's improved now because they've always sleep, they sleep as long as they want nowadays. <laughs> you, were, you couldn't do that in those days. You know, if you didn't get to sleep on time, there's no question, no question of taking rest in the day. No way. If you didn't get any sleep at night, that was it. You didn't get any sleep <coughs> in the day either. That was that. But the devotees were tired. They were tired. They worked very hard. And they slept very less. And they used to eat a lot as well. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, the combination. <laughs> <laughs> hard work. A lot of, a lot of, a lot of um, let little sleep. And, uh, a lot of eating. It's a good combination. You can, you can do it. You do tend to fall asleep when the class is going on. Because and when you're driving the car. Huh? And when you're driving the car. And when you're driving the car, yeah. Well, that dropper was really upset when the boy didn't fall asleep during the car. He said the driver must take extra sleep. At least the driver must not fall asleep. Many devotees lost their bodies like that. It was a very terrible thing. Anyway, what happened to Somalika? So he went back, and then on his way back to Millfield, he fell asleep again for a moment. And there they were. Action! Why have you given Somalika so much wealth? What can I say? He worked so hard, he deserved it. But now it is up to you, bro. <coughs> immediately, <coughs> immediately, so Malika knocked out of his. Oh, you have a car. Immediately snapped out of his uh, sleep. Of course, he really assumed. Oh no! Oh, don't tell me it's happened again! No, please, God! He looked in his trunk. Nothing there. Not even one cent. Nothing. He looked up. There was a tall tree with branches. He had a rope with him. He climbed up the tree. Put the rope, tie the rope, the branch, put the noose around his head. But he's just about to jump off and commit suicide. Let's see. 
Just he was doing that. Somalika! Oh God, it's you again! It's you again! Providence was it. I can't even commit suicide! <laughs> Let me go, will you? Said, Somalika, what do you want? You know what I want. I want wealth! You think that will make you happy? Of course it will make me happy! All right, then. I can give you wealth. If you can give me wealth, why did you, why did you do what you did in the first place? Alright, because I want to teach you a lesson. Oh, what is that? You go back to that town where you made your wealth. So he did, he went back, he said, I will arrange everything, brothers. I want you to visit the house of a very rich man in that town. So he went to the house of a very rich man. And he saw very rich man was very unhappy. Miserable, miser, nasty. Everything, nothing. It was very unpleasant in the experience. Then he said, You go to the house of a very poor man. He went to the poor man's house. And the poor <coughs> man received him like God. He gave practically gave his house to him, a small house, but he gave everything to him and treated him with such love. He felt so happy in that. Then he had a realization that wealth is not really a, a guarantee of happiness in any way. Piety means to be steady in one performance of one's particular duty. So he returned to his home and lived very simply, but happily there, therein, putting Krishna in the center. The goal of life is not to become wealthy. The goal of life is not to enjoy sense God. Is to actually we live in this world with the gifts of God, offer those gifts to the Supreme Lord and live simply in this world. Not to say that's going to make you happy depending on your karma, but if, that, if we live like that at least we won't be agitated by the never-ending driving desires which come into our mind. They never end. It's a never-ending flow. We so try to be satisfied with the gifts of God. And if Krishna gives us more, fine. Just use them in Krishna's service. By offering our fruits of our work to Krishna, our work to Krishna, and then our consciousness to Krishna, everything eventually, of course, belongs to Krishna. We try to offer it to him. He's stuck in my throat and nasal scene. Thus the devotee being frustrated in his repeated attempts at economic development ultimately takes solid shelter under the lotus feet of the Lord. We realize Krishna is very kindly making obvious we have no, even with our minds, not to speak of externally, the mind, we take shelter of so many different methods and so many different thoughts and so on, even to control our mind while chanting. This technique, that technique, so many, they may be useful. But ultimately it's only when we say, when we surrender to Krishna, by His mercy, when we actually appeal to Him. We cannot, as Bhakti Siddhanta, Bhakti Vinod Thakur, we said, it's impossible, impossible for the jiva to single-handedly control the illusion of inattention. It's impossible. It can, it's only possible by the mercy of the Lord, therefore one should pray fervently for the Lord's mercy. So when we actually, you know, cry for Krishna. But it, that's what it means. Like a child crying for its mother. It's not some sentimental tears. It means when our heart is like that, that we're desperately calling out for Krishna. Now, we cannot save ourselves. We have the, the, only when we have that protection. We have to ask for that shelter. We have to ask for that protection. Even internally. Otherwise it's just a long battle. The mind never stops. My ass. Unlimited. Unlimited. Gives unlimited channels. Like on the television now you have unlimited channels. People watch things from all over the world. Previously there was only one channel. There were kids who were two. One to be BBC. Then <laughs> ITV came in. That was it. Two channels. One had it, one had adverts and one didn't. That was the difference. And uh, 
now there's millions of so many things you can so bewildering. Very bewildering. But whatever it is, we have to try to focus on as much as we can on praying on the mercy of the Lord is protection. In the course, the kind of action may also be accepted as Isha Vindavam Shita Shisham, whereby the Lord destroys one's material opulences but enriches one in spiritual understanding. That's the real wealth. The wealth is not material, the wealth is spiritual. In the course of our preaching work, we sometimes see that materialistic persons come to us and offer their obeisances to take blessings, which means they want more and more material opulences. Like this week, Lord. Swamiji, please give me your blessings. You know, my 110-year-old mother is sick. Please give blessings. <laughs> oh, I've lost my job. Please give your blessings. We have exams coming. My wife is pregnant. Please give blessings. Yes, in one sense it's there. It's not the real blessings, as you know. When Papa was on a train in India one time, some Indian gentleman came into his compartment. They said, Swamiji, please give us your blessings. Papa said, yes, all right, I bless you. And there were two sannyasis, disciples of Prabhupada, sat down in the compartment and said, I bless you that you become like them. <laughs> <laughs> No, 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 Swamiji, please, no, no, don't give that blessing, not that blessing. I <laughs> said, <laughs> <laughs> my blessings are here. This is my blessings, my books are my blessings. Mm. You know, the blessing is how to get out of this place, not to make this damned place, you know, a nice place. The real blessing is how it may appear a little bit, you know, this and that, but the ultimate blessing is how to get out of this material world. That's all. In the course of our preaching, I mean, blessings. Some people think that's all that the Swami is, or the sadhus are for, is to bless them. Touch their feet and give me blessings. Please let me touch your feet and please give me your blessings. Mm -hmm. Dump their karma on you all the time. If such material opulences are checked, such persons are no longer interested in offering obeisances to the devotees. That happens. Even one devotee, Pranagopal, actually, yesterday. You know Pranagopal? He was telling me, he was watching in Vrindavan. He, he was all um, kind of like amazed by it. So many people, you don't even know it when you're in, in, in a holy place or in India or anything. Especially there. See, suddenly devotees and people were coming up when I was talking to somebody from behind, offering a, obeisances or from this side. And if I didn't recognize that, act of offering obeisances, he noticed that almost all of them went away looking disturbed. You know, they, they, it wasn't like they're, you know, there's a motive in doing it, it wasn't pure. The motive was to get recognition or some words of some kind, you know. He would have this kind of funny ideas like this. And then many of them were devotees, maybe beginning devotees. You can see it was a bit artificial. They offer obeisances to saintly persons. Um, such materialistic persons are always concerned about their economic development. And they offer obeisances to the saintly persons, or they, or they pray to God, the Supreme Lord, to give something, in, and, and give, they give something in charity, yes, the preaching work, with a view that they will be rewarded with further economic development. They may even give some, but they're thinking, now I'll get my return. However, when one is sincere in his devotional service, the Lord obliges the devotee to give up his material development and completely surrender unto him. Because the Lord does not give blessings of material opulence to his devotee, people are afraid of worshipping Lord Vishnu. Because they see the Vaishnavas who are worshippers of Lord Vishnu are poor in superficial material opulences. Sometimes people say, it's not always the case, but in many cases you hear this, and in many cases this is actually what it is. In some cases it's not. Such materialistic persons, however, get an immense opportunity for an economic development by worshipping Lord Shiva. For Lord Shiva is the husband of the goddess Durga, the proprietor of this universe. By the grace of Lord Shiva, a devotee gets the opportunity to be blessed 
by the goddess Durga. Ravana, for example, was a great worshipper and devotee of Lord Shiva. And in return, he got all the blessings of goddess Durga, so much so that his whole kingdom was constructed of golden buildings. Every building was made of gold. In Brazil, <coughs> what is this? in the present age, huge quantities of gold have been found. And from historical references in the Puranas, we can guess safely that this was Ravana's kingdom. Mm -hmm. This kingdom was, however, destroyed by Lord Ramachandra. Interesting. By studying such incidents, we can understand the full meaning of Isha Vidvam Shitar The Lord does not bestow material blessings upon the devotees, for they may be entrapped again in this material world by continuous birth, death, old age, and disease. Due to materialistic opulences, persons like Ravana become puffed up for sense gratification. Ravana even dared to kidnap Sita, who is both the wife of Lord, Ch Lord Ramachandra and the goddess of fortune, thinking that he would be able to enjoy the pleasure potency of the Lord. At the present moment, human civilization is too much attached to economic development and sense gratification and is therefore nearing the path of ruination. Is it true they're too attached to economic development and sense gratification? What do you think? You, some of you are working in that world. Are they so are really attached? Is that the motive, economic development? Isn't it? I'm talking the, the world around us. Yes? Isn't that the driving force behind even wars, even sometimes religions, isn't it? politics? Isn't it all driven? Isn't that Kali's main weapon, so to speak, the economics? But it states in the Bhagavatam that where there's force hoarding of gold, artificial monetary system products, and this is how Kali controls through the artificial monetary system. You know, we, now we have these credit cards and this thing and that thing. Isn't it? It's all very artificial. And people are completely locked in the system. It's all Kali's expert. The education system is part of that locking system. The medical system, everything is part of Kali's plan to keep everyone locked in that mesh. Age. And to get out of it is very difficult. And therefore, Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's Sangatan movement is the, uh, the method to cut through that knot or that bondage which we're in, knotted up. You can't live simple very easily these days, it's very difficult mm -hmm. in terms of you know, simple lifestyle. Oh, this Sankirtan is really the methodology for most, at least, of, uh, for everyone, in, in the real sense, of surviving in this age and, and uh, attaining freedom from this material trap. Sleeping. Um, um, when I was, when my dad was looking in Facebook, he found like. <laughs> <laughs> you gave the game away. Where is he? <laughs> yes. Welcome. Yes. Um, we found like the prime minister when he was um in the parliament. Um, he was like sleeping. <laughs> he was asleep in the parliament. <laughs> May the Prime Minister was in the middle of the session. Yeah. In the middle of the session. He was meditating. Huh? Meditating. Mm. Meditating. Meditating. Yeah, you see, I very often, 
I've seen judge, many times judges fast asleep during the court. I've seen that, I've seen that with my own eyes. Yeah, I've seen that with my own eyes. Judges. Because it's so damn boring sometimes, you know, you know this reading all these <coughs> evidences and stuff. You know. Yeah, people sleep in, in the office, I'm sure people fall asleep sometimes, don't they? Huh? No. No? Never? I never. I'm sure you do. <laughs> sometimes I'm out there all over the place. They, they have coffees. Pardon? They have coffees. Yeah, you take a lot of coffee, that helps to keep you awake, it's true. It's a drug, a legal drug. It's a legal drug. It's a legal form of amphetamine or something. Thank you for that interesting comment. Maharaj, in terms of, you know, like, um, that we are attached to, 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 to wealth and everything, when if Krishna takes away that wealth, uh, we want, don't want Krishna to take away the wealth, but in terms of being a grahastha, trying to provide for the family, um, how does that work? Like if I'm single, if, if wealth goes, I can just go into the Brahmana, in the, into the temple or the ashram, but being a family man, how, do, how, how can we take that instruction? Yeah, he sees if it's actually an obstacle or not. Okay. It may not be an obstacle. You know, especially when you know, not everyone's on the same level. We're on different stages, different stages, obviously, Krishna doesn't necessarily, unless you really ask him to, and unless there's some other factors involved, um, he won't necessarily do that. I mean, he, may be, he may not get as much as you want sometimes, you know, maybe a little bit, you know, maybe, maybe you do, but Krishna knows exactly what is favourable for us, so he's not going to take it away if it's not favourable. Mm -hmm. And if, they, for instance, the wife is not up to the standard, or up to the mark, or the husband's up to the mark, which is not going to unnecessarily create some kind of unnecessary disturbance within the situation of the home. Mm -hmm. That does sufficient to nurture and, and uh, maintain one's family, <coughs> household, etc. In most cases, he's not going to take away. What he's really going to, what his real plan is, whatever it takes, the externals are not really the main thing. Whatever, it, whatever is favorable for you to actually develop, uh, say, genuine detachment from this world. You can still have billions of dollars and be detached. You can have, you know, palace and still be detached. And there are many examples of pure devotees who are extraordinary. I mean, even instead, Yudhisthira Maharaj and Krishna happened. This is discussing Yudhisthira Maharaj here. And there's another instance, one of the Prasad who said, Yudhisthira Maharaj, when Krishna said to ask for me any benediction, he said, I want opulence. And then I said, Yudhisthira. After all these years, I thought you were a devotee. Why are you asking me for material options? And he said, because I want to show people that you know, your devotees are not only poor, they are also rich. Mm -hmm. So, you know, different reasons. The Lord may do different things. Sometimes it may be, to be opulent, may actually be beneficial for the beneficiary, beneficial mm -hmm. for the devotee and the community's Krishna consciousness. Uh, because that will help eventually to take away your, one's attachment to this material world. Have, if you don't, sometimes if you have no offenses, you're just thinking about it all the time. It ain't going to do you much good. You know, you just meditate on how I can become rich. You know, there's no real value. Get, do it and move on. Um, that's sometimes Krishna, if you're very advanced Krishna, they also give great offenses sometimes if they're meant to use it in that way. Of their lesson is to teach how you know simple living. Or many of the Goswamis they living with nothing. They were very rich before they became mm -hmm. sannyas. So Krishna teaches different lessons in different ways. You know, for example, people are very rich. And they're also Pandit Vini was extremely open. And mm -hmm. He taught through him how you can be extremely open and also be a pure devotee. So it just depends on the situation. But he's not going to take anything away which is unfavorable or is. Um, would be detrimental to you having a chance to realize or to, to um, become more dependent upon Krishna. Depending on the attitude of the devotee, really. More on the attitude. Mm -hmm. it's definitely not to, just because you've got opulence, is not going to take it away necessarily. If you're not using it in Krishna service and it's actually entangling one in the material world, mm -hmm. uh, and you know, opening the doors for sense gratification, then 
And then Krishna may you take things away. To, to, if it, it is going to teach us the lesson. If we're not ready for the lesson, he may not do it. He only does it when we're ready for the lesson. So if we're not ready for the lesson, you know, just like anything, you're like a child, you, you know, <coughs> certain stages you may you know, take certain things or may be you know, you help the child to understand, to let go of these things at a certain stage. You may even have to take them away at a certain stage if they're actually not letting go. Even dummies, sometimes you have to take the dummy away at a certain time. Generally speaking, you know, certain things, certain stages are unfavorable to go to the next stage. So to speak. And then Krishna may help you to may help you to go and help to release us from that, which is holding us back. Last question here. We have two cases where Yuen Chira Prabhupada lost some of his spiritual items, like his wife sold his Bhagavad Gita, and in America his tablet got stolen. So, how would you explain cases like this? Um, besides just analyzing from a plain fact that you're in this material world and these things are part and parcel, so to speak, of material life, um, it always increased or it opened up to something else. Like his stealing of the type, typewriter was instrumental in his moving to the Bari. If that hadn't happened, he may not have moved to the Bari. If he hadn't moved to the Bari, he may not have met Michael Grant and Keith Ham and all these other persons who were the instigators of the movement, basically, and amongst the young people there. Um, so, you know, it was someone else instigated, and someone else gave him one anyway. It's like it engaged somebody else in devotion and service. And it, it was stealing of his Bible town or his wife signed his uh, Bhagavad for the Bhagavad Gita manuscripts. All was part of Prabhupada's kind of, it actually increased his uh, you know, attachment to Krishna, his determination to push forward the mission of Krishna consciousness. <coughs> Determined and helped him become, um, let's say, relieved of anything else which was holding back on his preaching in the rest of the world. And it's also a lesson where he's showing even if you do these things in the world, don't give up. Just determine and carry on, you see. Mm -hmm. In case you give up, why should I stay here? But Prabhupada was determined he carried on because he had the order of his spiritual master. So even if manuscripts or typewriters were stolen, mm -hmm. he, he showed that you shouldn't give up, you should be determined. And not just dependent on things going away, if you'd like them to go. You have to take shelter of Krishna, whatever happens. Lessons as well as his own personal motivations and movements were affected by these events. Okay, we'll finish then. Hare Krishna, lunchtime. An hour or so. Hare Krishna. Nice to have you. Enjoy your day here at New Goku. <coughs> No more wineries, okay, wait. No more wineries. No more wineries. Never had a public winery, Maharaj. No? Never. Never had a public winery. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, We're going to do the daily uh, worship of the day just now. Yeah. We're going to make a free drop. We're all like, where the bags? Are they in the car still, Shreya? The black bag is here, but the black bag is here, but the other bags are in the car. And so on, get them into the, uh, yeah. the room where I can understand. Yeah, I'll ask them where everybody else is staying.